It takes courage to do the right thing in the face of public clamor for the wrong thing. But when justice is not administered fairly, governments disintegrate and there's no protection for anyone, man or woman, black or white. Clarence Watts, one of the Scottsboro Board's attorneys. Good afternoon. I am so honored to be here. A special thank you to the archives for the invitation and the wonderful opportunity to share my book, Scottsboro Unmasked, Decatur Story. What a privilege. I'd also like to acknowledge the Morgan County Archives. Uh, that's a repository for many of the items that are in my book and the information. Again, more importantly, thank all of you for coming. Scottsboro Unmasked, Decatur Story. My book revisits the familiar Scottsboro Boys case, so named because of the small town where the first trial was held. It is more of the story, and the first of its genre to portray Decatur citizens who were caught in the aftermath of Jim Crowism and the horrible effects that the trial had on Decatur. In my book, I uncover little known or untold facts about the Scottsboro Boys case by capturing the voices and the experiences of people who actually rattled America's conscience by challenging decades of discrimination and prejudices in what I believe was actually the largest civil rights movement since emancipation. Scott's Brown Mass Decatur story isn't just about color line or inequality, but it also speaks to the resolve of people who actually courageously stood for justice. So how did all of this start? A few years ago, 2009, I was asked to participate on a committee with the Big Read program. And there the community read To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, I was asked to present a walking tour. And so I said, like me, yes, I will. Had no idea <laughs> what I was agreeing to. So then I uh, did some research on the Scottsboro Boys trial. And from that, this amazing journey. I found that a lot of the information about the trial, people, places, our city did not talk about them. So I went on a journey to share this information. So let's go, it's a tw in a twisted plight that actually began nearly 88 years ago next month. The Old South's ideology of equality put at risk the lives of nine black youth who were falsely accused of attacking or of raping two white women on a moving train. Predictably, Scottsboro Mass confronts the issues of systemic racism, anti-black, anti-Semitic, anti-communist, bigotry, equality, all subjects that are still relevant today. No trials in America's history had as many appeals or lasted as longer. All the trials, all the trials except the first was held in Decatur, Alabama. From these trials came two landmark Supreme Court rulings. So I want to ask you to come and walk with me on a journey. And this is a tale of a familiar story and a not so familiar. So it's 1931. The segregated South, the Great Depression, hobos, black and white, jumper training, leaving Chattanooga, headed for Memphis. 
Just as the train crosses into Alabama, an altercation ensues. Words exchange, a fight break out. Blacks get the best of the whites. The whites jump off the train or are thrown off the train at station. At the station in Stevenson, Alabama. The station master calls the sheriff. The sheriff, in turn, tries to stop the train in Scottsboro, but it had just sped by. He calls ahead to Paint Rock, Alabama, giving strict orders. Deputize every man you can and capture every Negro and bring them to Scottsboro. At Paint Rock, a posse of enraged town folk line each side of the tracks. They're armed with hatred, guns, makeshift weapons. They pull nine black youth off the train. They age from 12, some say 13, the youngest, to 19 years old. They were tied with plow line, herded on the back of a flatbed truck, and carried to Scottsboro, Alabama, where a lynching party was gathered. At the time of the arrest, six of the boys were looking for work. Two were traveling to Memphis to seek medical attention, and the other was headed to Sheffield, Alabama. The black youth, Haywood Patterson, Clarence Norris, Charlie Weems, who was the oldest and was involved with, in the fight with Haywood Patterson, Olin Montgomery, who was nearly blind and was on his way to Memphis to get eyeglasses, Ozzie Powell, Willie Robinson, who suffered from a serious case of venereal disease. He was so swollen that he couldn't walk. He had to have a cane to emulate. Eugene Williams, who was the second youngest. Brothers Andy and Roy Wright. Andy had been a good student in school, but when his father passed, he had to quit school to help support the family. Roy Wright, who was the youngest boy, This child, it was his first time attempting to ride the rails. But also on the train were two women who were disguised as men, dressed in men's caps, coats, and overalls. Victoria Price, who was 21, they called her Big Legs, and Ruby Bates, who was 17. They were meal workers and said to be of loose character. <laughs> the two had hopped a train to Chattanooga the day before and were returning home to Huntsville from their excursion. Ruby Bates actually was from Eva, Alabama and had only moved to Huntsville a few years prior to this. Afraid they'd be arrested for vagrancy or in violation of the Mann Act, that made it a crime for women to cross state lines for immoral purposes, they invented a story that they were assaulted by the blacks. On a side note, Chuck Berry and boxer Jack Johnson were convicted under the Mann Act. That afternoon, the nine youth were charged with attacking the two white women. Twelve days later, the boys were on trial with incompetent attorneys, Milo Moody, who was senile, and Stephen Roddy, who was a drunk. In four days' time, eight other youth were condemned and sentenced to die in the Yellow Mama, Alabama's electric chair, so named because it was painted the same color of the striping on the state highway. Making history, it was the first time that eight men had been sentenced to die at one time in the state of Alabama. The youngest boy, Roy Wright's conviction was ended in a mistrial because of his age. And later in 1932, Alabama Supreme Court reversed death sentences for Eugene William because of his age under Alabama law. Appeals of the death sentences led to the first United States Supreme Court ruling 
in Powell versus Alabama, declaring that the defendants were denied the right to effective counsel, renouncing their 14th and 6th Amendment rights. Death sentences reversed, cases sent back to Scottsboro to the lower court, George Chingley, an international labor defense or ILD attorney, filed a motion to quash the indictments and request a change of venue to Birmingham, Alabama. Two years later, after their arrest, March 27, 1933, national attention was on my hometown, Decatur, Alabama. The retrials opened 50 miles from Scottsboro. Depression era town had approximately 20,000 people, 3,000 blacks. The foundry had closed, railroads had major layoff, mills as well as other businesses had shut down. Hundreds of people gathered here at the two-story yellow brick courthouse amid Lady Justice and the Confederate Soldier Monument to get a glimpse of the prisoners. The youth have been on death row since their conviction. So arriving in Decatur, they were placed in a vomit-infected jail that had been condemned for white prisoners just a few years earlier. Prominent New York Attorney Defense Counsel Samuel Leibowitz accepted the case pro bono with Chamley and Joseph Broski, they came to Decatur. Also, in one of the little nuggets that's very seldom talked about in Decatur, uh, attorney T.C. Alman assisted with selecting the jury in the Haywood Patterson case. Therefore, first order of business, the defense dream team was to attack Alabama's jury system. No black had sat on a jury since Reconstruction. Actually, one newspaper reported that Alabama didn't think a black man was capable of making a decision on the fate of another person. So to prove that blacks had systematically been left off jury rows, Leibowitz and his legal team went to Old Town Decatur's oldest and predominantly black neighborhood. The lawyers for the defense met with the African American community at the historic First Baptist Church to strategize about potential jurors and to ensure black participation. Not subpoenaed. Ten fearless Jackson County men testified that they had never seen a black man to ever serve on a Jackson County jury. Thomas Knight, Jr. was the youngest attorney general at the time, and still is, in the history of Alabama. He was the prosecutor. In question of the blacks, he was brutal. After all, this was an accusation, an attack on Southern white womanhood. John Sanford, a member of the George Chapel Methodist Church, where the museum in Scottsboro is now, was a victim of Knight's insult as he moved and pointed his finger in Mr. Sanford's face. Leibowitz jumps up on one occasion and said, you need to respect the witness. Call him Mr. Knight said, I am not in the habit of doing that. Of the nearly 30 subpoenaed black, they were professionals, they were all educated, most had two or three degrees. They were property owners, business owners, men who did not worry about the consequences or the backlashes from testifying. Now, any of you who have followed this case have heard about the one list that Dr. Frank Sykes provided. But three other gentlemen provided lists as well. Mr. Hewlett Banks, Reverend Lester Womack, and J.J. Sykes 
They all provided lists of black citizens in the county who they deem eligible to serve on jury panels. All the witnesses, including the jury commissioner, testified that they had never seen a single person of the colored race to serve on the jury in that county. One commissioner boldly boosted. He said, I place all qualified men on the roll, but I've never taken the trouble to find out if any blacks were intelligent or honest enough. The Attorney General was outraged at responses from the blacks when Professor William J. Wilson, who was from Matthews, Alabama, Montgomery native, and principal of Carver School, was asked if he believed that men would be sent to jail without a cause. He said, in Alabama, a colored man being sent to jail does not always mean that he's a criminal. Each of the potential jurors concurred. They were competent to serve on Morgan County's jurors, and they knew others as well. Defense attorneys would later force the court to produce the large jury book with Morgan County's secret jury roll to prove that blacks had been systematically barred from serving detailed descriptions about these potential jurors are in my book. Judge James Horton of Limestone County presides over Haywood Patterson's first trial or the retrial indicator. The jurors had a reputation, many say he looks like Abe Lincoln, but he had a reputation of being honest, decent, and respectful of the truth. Captain Joseph Burleson and the Alabama National Guard from Hartsell, Alabama, had been activated, ready with their bayonets. Inside the courtroom, the segregated room was, was petitioned off, and it was filled with racial hatred. The 425 first-come, first-served seats were filled, and Horton had cautioned the crowd about violence. Around 2 o'clock that afternoon, cars rushed onto the courthouse lawn, armed with guns. Deputies abruptly jumped out of their car and they ordered the prisoners out who were dressed in prison-issued uniforms of denim overalls and shackled in pairs, and they are unloaded as they usher them into the courthouse. Now, outside the courtroom, the hallway was packed with onlookers, and if you notice, the segregated lines, even standing in a line. Despite Leibowitz's argument about the exclusion of blacks, an all-white jury was selected. During my research, I found that two of those men were brothers-in-law and lived in the same household. Strategic meetings were held in organizations such as the Negro Ministerial Alliance ignited a fire in the Old Town community by forming a coalition with one simple mission, and that was to show up in court every single day. Northern black reporters with the Afro-American and Norfolk Journal newspapers were given press passes and they sat at a makeshift table close to where the black spectators were. And I found it odd that my hometown, Decatur Daily's newspaper, did not print any stories. They relied on Thomas Davenport, who was an Associated Press reporter. So now, the jury sequestered that pre-Palm Sunday, the 12 attend St. John's Episcopal Church. Reverend Peter Dentis uh, showed great valor when he admonished the crowd. And this was when all the newspaper reporters were there at the church. He said, open your hearts. 
Banish hatred and hypocrisy. Do not be like those star-fed souls that nail the Lamb of God to the cross on Calvary. Took a lot of courage for him to do that. During Jim Crow, it was socially inappropriate for blacks and whites to be together. So New Yorkers were caught in the company of blacks on Vine Street. Vine Street was a hub uh, during segregation where there were several businesses, uh, indicator doctor's offices. It was that hub. Every town had one. So they were arrested and among them was soon to be poet and political activist and author Muriel Reisker. Haywood Patterson was the first to go to trial. The star witness, Victoria Price, gave explicit details about the alleged rape, using words that embarrassed most of the women and some of the men in court. She was defiant when the defense questioned her as well. Now, as a side note, Leibowitz insinuated that Miss Price was one of Miss Kate's girls. And, the, and Miss Kate was a local person. She uh, was a madam indicator who ran a brothel. Uh, one of, she was Sip McGee's girlfriend. Dr. Bridges of Scottsboro, who examined the two women shortly at, within hours of the alleged attack, said that there was no sign of hysteria. And when you read my book, you'll see where Judge Horton kept asking him question after question after question, medical questions. Well, Judge Horton actually had uh, gone to medical school before he became an attorney. Ruby Bates, one of the accusers who had been missing, shows up in court, and guess what? She's a witness now for the defense. She recants her story. So when Leibowitz is questioning her, trying to get some things out of the way, he says, were you attacked? No, sir. Why did you lie? I told it just like Victoria did, because she said we might have to stay in jail if we did not frame up a story after crossing a state line with men. The atmosphere in Decatur was volatile. On several occasions, burning crosses spewed at the home of Dr. Frank Sykes, where black reporters Jones and Young stayed. The African American community armed themselves to protect their families. The reporters were shuffled from house to house in what I call an underground railroad system, just for their safety. During the trials, lynch mobs were stopped uh, on one occasion, there was a black man who had came to court to testify, and he was confronted at the train depot, ran for his life, and hid until early the next morning. Also, at the train depot, crosses burned during broad daylight. Often the prosecutors mocked the defense attorney. Ruby, uh, they said things like, Ruby sold out for a pair of shoes, a hat, and a coat. And they talked about uh, uh, Lester as using his hands like the New Yorkers did. But on April 8th, the case went to the jury. Despite all the evidence, on Sunday morning, when most of the churches were holding Palm Sunday services, a verdict was reached. Haywood Patterson was sentenced to death for a second time. And notice some of the questions that Judge Horton had asked himself. Just by listening to the evidence. And in a dramatic twist, on June 22, 1933, Judge Horton's conscience and his honor led him to take a brave stand. 
Reading his hour and five minute opinion, he stated, women of the character shown in this case are prone for selfish reasons to make false accusations of both rape and insult upon the slightest provocation with ulterior motives. Overturning Patterson's second death sentence, his actions received praise, condemnation, and even threats. The decision to do the right thing was political suicide for him. He lost the election the following year. Now, in the meantime, Knight was constantly trying to get Horton removed from these cases. So with the assistant of former Senator Tom Heflin, he finally had it done. So he was successful in doing that. And in October 1933, Juris William Callahan, a known white supremacist, was the new judge in town. Because of his haste to hear the case, he earned the name Speedy Callahan. The judge presided over all the cases from late 1933 to 1937. His main objective, he said, was to debunk the Scottsboro Boys case, get it off the front pages of the newspapers. He banned cameras from the courthouse and the vicinity. And he shouted, won't be any more picture snapping around here. In the meantime, the second U.S. Supreme Court decision was made. Norris versus Alabama, 1935. It helped that Negroes were unjustifiably omitted from jury services in the Scottsboro Boys case. This systematic exclusion on jury rows because of race violated, again, the 14th Amendment. Thus, we have what we call a jury of one's peers. As a result of this ruling, Alabama passed the Welch Jury Bill, authorizing jury commissioners to refill the jury boxes with names of Negroes. The most incredible discovery for me in finding names of the first blacks who sat on Morgan County juries after that judgment, but then to find the names of the first ones who sat on ju who potential jurors for the Scottsboro Boys trial. And what was amazing and just so unbelievable is that these were men that I knew growing up as a little girl. Men who lived in my block or in the block, a couple of blocks from me. I was just shocked. Mr. Barry Fogg, Mr. Steve Wynn lived right across the street from us. Mr. George Efford and so many others who were right there in my community. And ladies, this was a time when it was against the law for women to serve on Alabama's jurors. It wasn't until 1966 in White versus Crook that women were granted that right. So shortly before Thanksgiving, Patterson's third trial began for the first time over Gilly, the hobo, and I witness uh, who was on the road trip with Victoria and Ruby testified. Now, isn't that odd? He's just testifying. Later, Hayward Patterson would receive a third death sentence. I was so, again, shocked while visiting Jackson County a few, a couple of years ago. A friend asked me, well, what are you writing now? I said, well, I'm writing a book on Scottsboro Boys trial. He said, well, my granddaddy was involved with that. I said, eh, huh? What? How? <laughs> well, my first inkling was that perhaps he was one of the men who jumped off the train. You know, initially, Victoria Price had said that there were 12 men who raped them. Three supposedly jumped off a train between Paintwalk and Stevenson. So I thought, well, gosh, is it one of them? 
I was shocked when I found out that it was Sam Mitchell. Now, Mr. Mitchell was the only black witness for the state ever. And I was just amazed that I had known this family all that time and didn't know that about them. But another st astonishing discovery was what I call a deja vu moment. Now, in Decatur, shortly before Charlie Weems' case, there was an allegation of rape by a white woman. Tom Brown, a black man, was arrested. James Royal, a 16-year-old black boy, was lynched. The community was terrorized. And I thought, what a notable part of the Scottsboro Boys case that nobody talks about. Seldom, if any, spoken of. And I was amazed when I came to the museum and there memorialized James Royal's name and dirt. Now I want you to note some of the concerns of the community. Haunted by the impact of the trial, many in the black community were afraid and feared violence. The family, they thought the families might be harmed. They'd lose their jobs, and many did. They were terrified of legal lynchings, as well as the possibility of death. Captain Burleson uh, and others had heard comments and they shared that information with Judge Horton. The white community had uh, talked to different people and these are some of the comments, comments excuse me, that they had about the trial. And there are more in my book. July 1937, no post. The state decided that they would no longer prosecute five of the youth. Now, only five, four were released. That was Eugene Williams, Olin Montgomery, Willie Robinson, and Roy Wright. Ozzie Powell, who's supposed to have been in that group, had attacked a deputy leaving trial indicator near Coleman, and so he had received 20 years for that particular act. Dr. Newman Sykes, a black physician and manager of a family funeral home, provided the cars and sneaked Leibowitz and his team as, and the clients out of Decatur. All the gentlemen received anywhere from 75 to life during that time. Andy Wright was later released uh, in, what, on parole, and this was a back and forth thing. He'd go on parole, they'd arrest him again, he'd go on parole again. But uh, Patterson actually received a 75-year sentence for rape this particular time. And in 1948, he escaped and fled to Michigan. In January 1936, Leibowitz decided, well, we need a Southern boy on this trial. So he obtained the assistance of attorney Clarence Watts. And one of the things that Watts argued was that Thomas Knight, now the newly elected lieutenant governor of Alabama, should not continue to prosecute these cases. But of course, he lost that argument. Taking his brother's name, Clarence Norris, on parole, left Alabama in 1946 and moved north. And in 1976, he received a full pardon from Governor George Wallace. Well, what's the message in Scottsboro Mast? I believe that it's important for future generations that our stories our stories are representative of us. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Our history isn't always pretty. 
nor is it always comfortable. But it's our story, and there are still lessons to be learned from those stories. There are lessons to be learned from people who stand up against wrong. People like Judge Horton, the brave blacks who testified, the community, Ruby Bates, Captain Burleson, the defense team, Eugene Bailey, Lamar Moyer, who was a University of Alabama student who said the Negroes should be tried in court and acquitted today with so many, many countless senseless violent acts on people, many in the name of justice. I ask myself while writing this story, when will Lady Justice's eyes truly be blind to racial prejudices? I ask myself, when will the scales of justice truly be balanced? I believe that it's when we, as a people, do the right thing morally. <coughs> So what is justice? Justice is just that. It's doing the right thing for the right reason. The 1930s trial was not the end of this story. On April 22nd, 2013, in a bipartisan effort, Alabama unmasked one of its most heinous crimes when Governor Robert Bentley signed bills to posthumously pardon Haywood Patterson, Charlie Weems, and Andy Wright. In one of the worst forms of tyranny and injustice, after years of trials and convictions, another bill exonerated the nine Scottsboro co-defendants. The Scottsboro boys have finally received justice, said Governor Bentley. It's important to clear the names of the Scottsboro boys. Thank you again for sharing the afternoon with me. There's so much more in my book. So to learn more, you'll have to read my book. It's available for you out there. I'll now entertain a few questions. Microphones here for you, and so we ask you just raise your hand, and we'll bring you a microphone, and you can ask Ms. Towns a question. As an 80-year-old black man, born in Pink Spottom, Alabama, in Dallas County, Alabama, I, I I get upset. I got upset when I was put that 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 Governor Bentley had. That didn't help the Cosmo boys at all. They were dead, and they had not received justice at all. That was no money given to any of their descendants or anything like that. So it, to me, it was cosmetic. Uh, Alabama, born here, went to high school here, attended Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, taught at Alabama State University, so I'm, I'm an Alabamian all the way through. Mm -hmm. But I still think that we are still fighting the Civil War and we are still in the era of segregation, regardless of that. When do you think we're going to ever turn the page? I, every time I read the Scottsboro, I get upset. I get, I get entirely pissed off. <laughs> Governor Callahan, no, I mean, Attorney Callahan, just went on a rampage. Judge Horton should have just dismissed the case, period. He did not, even though he suffered from that. And I don't want to give a a testimony about it because this is not a prayer meeting. But what I'm saying, when we ever, will we ever turn the page of history in this, in, this, in, this, in this state of ours? So that I don't want justice to be blind. I want justice to be eyes open, so I can fair and see everybody. When we, when we all be treated fairly in the state of Alabama. Now, I know that's a long uh, diatribe to a certain extent. <laughs> In my opinion, it's when we as a people stop looking at each other as color 
and see each other as individuals. One of my reasons in writing this story and telling this story is, is hoping that it will inspire people to stand up for the truth. And only uh, Martin Luther King said it, uh, injustice anywhere. You know, so it affects us all. This story, even though I primarily talk about African American history, it's our history. And the only time that we embrace that will be when we can go forward, when we can embrace who we are. If you look around in this room, all of us, no, no man is an island in time of itself. It takes each of us, and when we stand in our truths, then we can make this world better. That's my opinion, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Can you give us the rest of the story? The Scottsboro Nine, what happened to them? Did they live great lives? Did they not? No. You'll need to read my That's book. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, Clarence Norris died of old age. Haywood Patterson uh, got in a fight with a gentleman in a bar, and uh, he was sentenced to prison. Actually, died a few months after going to kill the man, and died a few months after uh, going to prison. I think he had lung cancer. Uh, the youngest guy, Roy Wright, and we thought he was actually on the right road. He uh, joined, I believe, the Merchant Marines and uh, came home on a furlough and found his wife uh, with someone and killed her and, uh, and himself. But the, the thing is, is that it's such a travesty because it's what was done to these boys. These boys, and, and uh, but you'll have to read my book and, and get the rest of the story. Yes. Uh, Ms. Allen, thank you so much. Uh, and forgive my ignorance on the legal system, and maybe you could help me understand the purpose or the strategy when, I guess, they put on trial Mr. Patterson, why they didn't put them all on trial at the same time. What is the purpose of, I guess, did they do it one at a time? Is that what made the process so long? Uh, initially, in the trial in Scottsboro, they tried them two by two, okay. and uh, the actually the defense wanted the prosecution wanted them to all be tried together, and uh, the defense barked against it. So, and and, and this is uh, and you'll have to read my book too. <laughs> What had happened, there's a lot of dynamics in here because of all of the, the hatred and it, it, trials were postponed at time. And uh, so it's just a lot of dynamics, the reason that, that they lasted so long. There was, again, remember that these trials had more appeals. And then, you know, you got to go to Alabama, you got to go through the uh, proper chain, uh, more appeals and lasted longer than any other trials in the country. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I was thinking how all of this was based on a lie and misunderstandings and the lives that were ruined, the families that were ruined, the communities that were ruined, mm -hmm because of a lie and has that changed in the last how many years three quarters of a century I don't think it has and for the gentleman that said when in the world is this going to change education surely and seeing each other as human beings but not buying into such lies and the thing is, is that many people knew that they were lying. <laughs> uh, look at uh, the, the boys in New York not long ago. Just look at everything that we see that's happening in the media now. 
people stand on lies. They're, and and that's, it's sad, but it's the truth. It's who they are. People stand on hatred. It's sad, but it's the truth. And so, again, until we as a people come together, until we unite and say no more, we'll continue to go through that vicious cycle. So it takes courage, it takes courage for each one of us to stand and make that difference, to say, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. Yes, ma'am. Where did the last woman come forward and say the truth? Early on, actually in the in Hayward Patterson's first retrial, um, she had been missing the entire month, well, part of January, entire month of February. But when the trial came in April, she had actually gone to New York and a preacher had convinced her to tell the truth. Uh, came back, I believe it was to Montgomery, and then they sent Miss May Jones to escort her back to Decatur. But uh, it was early on, and, and they had actually found a letter where she had written her boyfriend and told him that they did not, uh, the, the, yes. <laughs> so after uh, receiving that letter, the prosecution, prosecuting attorney had actually met with her about it. But again, this, uh, even today, People are on a bandwagon to promote themselves, and you know it. It by any means necessary. So, yes, ma'am. Hi, Peggy. Um, this is my teacher. <laughs> she used to be many, many years ago. Hi. And she was a great student <laughs> then, and I'm so proud of her. You know, I found it interesting what you said today about the Decatur Daily not sending reporters and using the, I guess you said the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the more liberal or socially conscientious papers of the time. Why, I mean, have you ever found out why the Decatur Daily didn't send its own reporters? They just choose not to get involved, and I do have a letter uh, where uh, uh, that was written to the governor about the case from the daily. It's not in my book. It was something I found much later. And did you interview any of the Horton family? No, but Kathy has a report on the back of my book, and she is uh, Judge Horton's granddaughter. Uh, what led me to the discovery of this deja vu moment, I was talking to a lady, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Sherrod lived on Vine Street, so I was interviewing older people in the community to ask them about the Scottsboro Boys trial. <laughs> this particular lady, uh, Miss Celeste, she told me, she said, well, you know, there was a, a black boy, young black boy riding his bicycle was killed right after bringing daddy some medicine. <sighs> what? <laughs> I never heard of that before. She, she didn't know his name, she didn't know anything about him, she just knew that he was, it was right below the house. And so I could not wait to get to the archives the next day and I started turning pages in newspaper and there it was, James Royal was shot down. So it's those little uh, tidbits of information that I share in my book. I did note, uh, notice that in a couple of books his name is mentioned, but there's no detail. There's nothing about the uh, alleged rape that went on. There's nothing. And uh, so, of course, I feel that this was should have been a part of our story that's told. And, and that's what I'm trying to do, share our story. And prayerfully, it would make us a better pe people. All right, we have uh, time for one more question, if anyone has one. No more questions? Let's, then let's give uh, Ms. Towns a huge Thank round of applause. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much Thank for your wonderful presentation. You.
And uh, remember, you can buy uh, Ms. Town's book in the lobby, and she will be here for any questions or if you'd like her to sign a copy. We hope to see you again next month. Thanks. Thank you.